A sad story out of Kansas City, Missouri. Objectively tragic news of a 16-year-old boy, black boy, named Ralph Yarl, who was sent by his mother to pick up his siblings at 1500 Northeast. I can't remember the name of the street. 1500 Northeast Street, and instead he went to 1500 Northeast Terrace. Whatever it may be, he ended up at the wrong address. Conflicting reports then ensue about what occurred. What seems clear is something that occurred just before 10 p.m. at night was that Ralph Yarrow rung the doorbell. 84-year-old man who lives inside the house, Andrew Lester, gets up out of bed from watching television. He has a solid door on the inside with a clear glass storm door on the outside, both of which are locked. He opens the inside solid door and sees Ralph Yarl, reportedly well over six feet tall. In Lester's estimation and report, pulling on the handle and coming inside or attempting to come inside the glass door. Lester pulls out his revolver, fires through the glass door, striking Jarl in the head. Once he's on the ground, Lester shoots again and strikes him this time in the arm. Jarl retreats to the street where he is found later by authorities bleeding. Jarl is alive and in serious condition. Lester was arrested and held for several hours before being released on his own recognizance. This is a story that is plastered around most of your mainstream media. CNN.com, New York Times.com, Washington Post, MSNBC, CNN on television. And it is being told through a somewhat familiar, if somewhat unique, circumstances, a somewhat familiar narrative. And that is that Ralph Yarl was shot ringing a doorbell while black. There are protests, there are signs that it is not a crime to ring a doorbell. It is undoubtedly a very sad and and tragic story. It is most likely, without knowing more of the details, not an easily identifiable, much less provable crime. If Andrew Lester reasonably perceived his life to be in danger through what he thought was an imminent break-in, He has a right to self-defense. And these are some of the tragic mistakes that happen inside of the human condition. Of course, the case is being made that this would not happen were Ralph Yarl not black. Now, I don't know, and I will not pass judgment on any conclusions, because I don't know, as is often the case in these types of situations, all of the facts I didn't know all of the facts around the reports that a noose was found inside of Bubba Wallace's NASCAR garage. What that led me to was a lack of conclusion and inherent, in in my estimation, necessary skepticism on everyone else's conclusion that a randomly assigned garage inside of a NASCAR facility would suddenly show up you know, a garage where often there are pull ties to pull down a garage door, randomly show up in a noose. But that kind of skepticism, the refusal to draw a conclusion, is, of course, for a good half a decade now, evidence of racism. If you do not see it primarily and exclusively through the prism of race, then you are not unlike the alleged racist shooter, racist. This is the modern American instinct, and we can see it play out in story after story. Interestingly, this last week, uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was mocked because he highlighted to MSNBC's Al Sharpton how America's roads and bridges were racist. He talked about disparities in traffic accidents, pedestrians hit by cars, that more, I believe in his words, black, brown, tribal, indigenous people of color 
are victims of traffic accidents, pedestrian accidents, and so forth because of a lack of access to crosswalks and lights. And I don't know what else that makes a road racist. What's interesting about this, no, rather, what's important about this, and I said this the other day on The Five, is this. Racism exists in America. That is an undeniable fact and one that maybe is not said aloud by people like me. And when I say people like me, I mean, I don't know, conservative, white men, rational, fact-based men who look at individual circumstances and ask, what are the contributing factors? When you do that, I know, I know, and I'm not passing judgment or telling you what's right or wrong. I'm simply telling you that I know through personal experience a reality that people think when you do that, you are denying the existence of racism because they see things, almost everyone does, through the two windows, their own two windows to the world, their eyes, their experience. And most black Americans have experienced racism in their lives. So when you deny or ask for the facts and stand in the way of a conclusion in a particular story in the news, what many people feel is that you are denying their own existence, their own experience. But that's not what's taking place at all. What's taking place is in the court of public opinion, simply asking for not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but a shred of evidence to back up a claim. So let's start with this. There is racism in America, and I have no doubt that it has been experienced. I do not think that racism is the exclusive province of perpetrator or victim of any one particular race. I think there are white racists. There are Latino racists. I think there are black racists. I think there are white victims of racism. Ah, That's true. I do. I think there are brown victims of racism, and I think there are black victims of racism. I think there is black racism towards white people, and I think there is white racism towards black people. And I think all of it is actually on the rise in America because racial division has been fueled by destructive and dangerous people hell-bent on their own personal gain. I will introduce you to one of these destroyers, perhaps the most dangerous man in America, in moments. But I do not think racism in modern America is largely explained through the prism of systemic racism, meaning the justice system or the legal system. I don't think it is completely irrelevant and eradicated. From every system in America, because I think every system in America is driven by human beings. For example, do I think there is racism in sports? Let's just narrow in on officiating. I do. That's not because I think the system of officiating is racist, but rather officials and referees are made up of individuals. I've seen this. And again, just to be clear, this is not to say officials and referees are racist. This is a very sensitive conversation that requires us not to have all passed the LSAT test, but to understand a few logical connections, right? Like it's a, is an infamous um, question in the law school examination, uh, entrance examination. And, and it goes something like this. All baseball players wear hats, but not all people that wear hats are baseball players. You see, There are racists in every walk of life, racist judges, racist lawyers, racist politicians, racist referees or officials, racist black people, racist white people. But that does not make all black people, all white people, all referees, all judges, all lawyers or all politicians racist. I've seen it play out in youth sports. Oh, I have. I promise you. I've told you before that. My son spent some time going to not just majority, but overwhelmingly predominantly black schools for much of their young life and on sports teams where they were literally at times one of maybe only one or two white boys on the team. And I promise you, I have seen referees blow a quicker whistle on behavior that is mirrored from a white player to a black player. Now, I don't think that makes the referee malevolent, you know, 
And I don't think that excuses every behavior of every player. But what I'm telling you is, what I think is, in America, which, by the way, systemic racism, if you really want to pinpoint the most obvious place of systemic racism in America, it's in the education system. It is in public education. And it has, by no coincidence, been the one place that Democrats have shown no interest in rooting out or pursuing, in fact, perpetuating systemic racism in public education. Just ask anyone who's been involved in charter schools. Now, I think systemic racism is at its lowest point in American history. I think America, by the way, just to be clear, as we're walking our way through this topic, I think America is the least racist nation. I think not only is America the least racist nation on the planet, I think America is the least racist nation in human history. That's right. Fact. I think it is the least racist nation in human history. I also do not believe that racism is the in the top, I don't know, several hurdles facing various populations in America, including black Americans. Not the top of the list of things holding back any any single individual. That doesn't mean, though, it doesn't exist in America. So I think America is the least racist nation in human history, the least racist time we live in now in American history. Systemic racism at its lowest point, quite obviously, with the abolishment of slavery, Jim Crow, the civil rights era, at its lowest point in American history. But racism yet remains, and in my estimation, it remains at the level of the individual. All right. Now, racism the acknowledgement of racism existing at the level of the individual requires work by every single individual to see each other through the prism of merit and character and judgment. And make no mistake, it is not wrong to also judge culture, but it is it is the work of every single individual to eradicate racism. And what I would suggest to you is the acknowledgement of the existence of racism is more undercut by not people that question the facts and circumstances of any given situation, but rather people that distort claims of racism to the point of absurdity, like Pete Buttigieg making his case for racist roads. That not only undercuts people going, yeah, there is still racism in America. I actually think it inflames racial division and creates more racism on the individual level in America. But there is nothing more destructive to race relations, nothing more, more devious than those who profit off of racial divisions and one of my, in, in my mind, one of the most destructive men in America is an attorney by the name of Ben Crump. Let's take this story back now to Ralph Yarl. I will withhold judgment because I do not know facts. I won't form conclusions until I understand the story. But I will say the case to be made that Ralph Yarl was shot ringing a doorbell while being black is undercut by the presence of Ben Crump. Look, if you are someone who has lied to me four times, regardless of your race, by the fifth time, I'm not going to be granting you the grace of truth, the benefit of the doubt. If you have been the boy who has cried wolf on Half a dozen occasions, I'm probably not going to show up when there's a wolf at your door. What is the saying that George Bush butchered? F fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Ben Crump has shown up to advocate for Ralph Yarl. Now, I don't think that says anything about Ralph Yarl nor the facts of the case in this tragic shooting of Ralph Yarl. But I do think as a messenger, it makes me inherently, righteously, rationally reserved, hesitant, skeptical. Why? Let us go through for a moment 
Ben Crump's resume. Let us go through how many times he has cried wolf. Ben Crump arrived on the scene and arrived into infamy in 2014 when he told the nation in the wake of the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, that Brown was killed while holding his hands up and asking the police not to shoot. He launched a saying that remains to this day, a falsehood, hands up, don't shoot. That did not happen. Michael Brown did not have his hands up. He did not ask the officer not to shoot. Michael Brown had just robbed a convenience store and punched the officer, ran away, turned, wheeled, and stormed at the officer. Don't trust me. Trust the Department of Justice under previous President Barack Obama, which disavowed the lie that was told by Ben Crump. Hands up, don't shoot. And that lie cost lives that lives destroyed the city of ferguson missouri burned down neighborhoods and if it matters to you the neighborhoods that they burned down were businesses owned by black and brown he in the wake of those riots that then spilled over across the nation saw people die at the hands of that lie and ben crump was only getting started in 2020 he told people that the police came to the wrong address in Louisville, Kentucky, and killed Breonna Taylor. I was having a conversation with a friend at work the other day. It was a case, I believe it was just last week in New Mexico, where the cops showed up to a guy's house. They're outside. They're armed. I think they're at the wrong house, right? The cops. And the guy doesn't know what's going on outside his house, so he comes out. He sees guys with guns. He pulls his gun. The cops shoot him and kill him. His screaming wife and kids inside call 911 say, my husband's a shot. There's people outside with guns. They don't know it's the cops. I don't know the facts. I don't know if the cops announced themselves. I don't know what. But I was telling this story and how tragic it is. And this guy said, yeah, that's, that, that's, you know, that's similar what happened with Breonna Taylor. They showed up to the wrong address. And, and I couldn't remember in the moment. Like, is that right? Are those the facts? And I went home I was like, that doesn't sound right. Because it's not right. That was the lie told by Ben Crump. That cop showed up to the wrong address. My friend still doesn't know the truth to this day. He thinks that lie is the truth. We're we're how many years removed? And the lie made its way around the world before the truth had a chance to get its pants on. That lie has been fact-checked and proven false by... Pull up, as we speak, the Louisville uh, Courier. It's right here. The Louisville Courier, the Courier Journal. Our rating of that claim, false. The address was right there on the search warrant. But Ben Crump, once again, seeded the lie. How about in the same year, in the most infamous case, at least in the past, I don't know, what? several decades, George Floyd. Ben Crump told the public that Floyd and Officer Derek Chauvin knew each other from a nightclub, insinuating there was a conspiracy afoot, that Chauvin might have had it out for Floyd. There was a personal vendetta and knew each other from the nightclub. False. It was a big year in 2020. That's the same year he told the public. You remember Dante Wright, who was killed by a police officer? She thought she, she says, she alleges she thought she was grabbing for her taser. She accidentally grabbed her service revolver. She fires into Dante Wright and kills him. Ben Crump says, without any evidence and no real ability to know, that she killed him intentionally. He's just reckless. Words are a plaything, a tool. They're knives that he throws throughout society. Whatever body falls, falls. Crump told the world that Jacob Blake, remember Jacob Blake Blake in Wisconsin, was unarmed and that he was there as a peacemaker to break up a fight. Just lie upon lie upon lie. You know that Jacob Blake had a knife. I don't know. Does your average person out there know that's a lie? Do they know that Jacob Blake was going for a knife? Do they know That his girlfriend had a restraining order against him? Do they know he was trying to drag kids out of the car? Do they know any of these things? Do they think he was there as a peacemaker, as told to them by Ben Crump? Do they believe he was unarmed based on the lie by Ben Crump? Do you remember Makia Bryant? Makia Bryant was the girl in a fight with her friend or another girl. And Makia Bryant had a knife. 
and she was attacking the other girl was back up was against a car. Do you remember this video? And Makia Bryant's lunging at the other girl, right? Officer shows up on the scene. He's yelling at him to stop, yells at him to stop, and then he fires and shoots Makia Bryant. Why? The officer says she had a knife. She's getting ready to plunge it into the chest of the other girl. Also, for what it's worth, a black girl. So a black girl about to kill another black girl. And Ben Crump says the officer shoots her and told her that told the world that Makia Bryant was unarmed. By the way, this one's extremely blatant because there was a video. You can go look it up right now, wherever social media you use. Go look it up. You can look up Makia Bryant. You will see the knife in her hand. Wasn't hard for anybody, including the officer, to see somebody's about to die. But Ben Crump's lie rules the world. All of these lies. Roughly, the estimates are, they say, from the riots in 2020 that, you know, went the whole summer of 2020, roughly $1 billion in property damage. In total, 30 deaths in America in the ensuing riots and an absolute destruction of race relations in America. Thanks to the boy who cried wolf, who fooled me not once, but tried to fool me better than half a dozen times. The liar, the destroyer, the most dangerous man in America. Ben Crump. And now Ben Crump is in Kansas City helping to make the case for Ralph Yarl. I am so sad for this young man. I have a 15 year old who's over six feet tall. I, this is who would no doubt, who would no doubt get the wrong address. Have I ever showed up at a house, knocked, thought I knew the people, and cracked open the door? Hey, you guys home? Yeah, absolutely, I have. It's tragic from start to finish. Is it? inconceivable that a guy would be sitting in his house and he goes to answer his door and he sees someone maybe pulling on the door. Maybe not. Ralph Yard says he wasn't and attempts to defend himself. Absolutely not. The world is full of tragedy and I will reserve understanding what happened. I'll reserve the conclusion beyond knowing that what took place was a tragedy. But I also know that there is a serial liar, a destroyer, on scene, who undercuts Ralph Yarrow, who weaves lie upon lie upon lie, who's attempting to tell the story in Ben Crump. Story number two, the rise of independence, at least in recent American history. What we're looking at is the largest percentage of Americans who identify neither as Republican or independents. A new poll out shows that almost half of Americans now describe themselves as independents, 49% according to a Gallup poll. This is a plunge in people who identify as Democrat or Republican. Since 2004, that's gone from 35% to 25%. That's for Democrats. And 33% to 25% for Republicans. Independents over that same time period went from 31% in third place, to 49%, well out ahead. What does this mean? Well, let me tell you what I think it doesn't mean first. People often mistake the idea of independence as people who are in search of a third party. I don't think that's true. I don't think they're looking for their modern-day Ross Perot. I don't think they're looking for a no-labels party. I also don't think it means that independents are centrists. That's often what is implied or understood or taken away. The independents are simply people who want a bipartisan approach to governance. And I don't think that's at all what that means by independence. They suggest this largely is driven by Gen X and millennials who I think simply do not see themselves through the lens of a partisan, of a party, of a team, of Democrat or Republican. But that does not mean they would consider themselves wishy-washy in the middle. I think many of these people are actually pretty extreme on some issues. And maybe it's on gun ownership or maybe it's on, you know, uh, the, the, the government leviathan. I know that there are many Republicans or rather many conservatives who look at the Republican Party and say, what have you done to control government? Probably would neglect to define themselves as Republican. They're independents. Does that make them centrists? Or what about Democrats who love Bernie Sanders? And God love them, at least, are honest. They want to see some socialism 
in America. Maybe they don't consider themselves Democrats. Does that make them centrists? But more importantly than that, what I think is going on is a scrambling of the political policy lines. And to this, I do largely attribute, at least it's revelation, the exposure of this, to Donald Trump. I think America first shuffled what it meant to be a Republican. Look, look, for most of history, Republicanism economically was not too distinguishable from libertarianism. As close as we can get to unfettered capitalism, the Republicans probably toy more, more with corporatism. Um, less regulation, less taxes. Rising tide lifts all boats. The free market, free trade. Make cheap goods in China. Progress with technology here. More education. And social conservatism. But what we've seen through Donald Trump is a belief inside of conservatism that the working man has been left behind. The middle class. Rural America. Those hollowed out by NAFTA and the ship and away of their jobs to China. A populist image began to be cultivated. I think a more empathetic image. Those left behind by corporatism in America. That wasn't who... That wasn't Mitt Romney. At the same time, Democrats always said they were for bringing jobs back home to America, that they were for the little man. And they increasingly embraced the idea of the Leviathan. I mean, they always were there for the Leviathan, but I'm talking about now. How about censorship? I mean, wasn't that supposed to be in the 90s, the thing that rock stars railed against Republicans? And now it's Democrats who wave the banner of silence, a bridge free speech. I think we took so many, not all, not 100%, but so many of the traditional issues, and we shook them up like before you play 42 with dominoes. You know, you ever had a shake in dominoes? Shake it up. You know, it's not going to be a perfect shuffle, but it sure shook up a lot of issues. And I think in the wake of that, many people are like, I don't know. I'm here, I'm there, I'm with this issue, and none of them fit any party. And then, by the way, on a more stylistic front, how about the rise of Joe Rogan? You know, what is Joe Rogan? I don't know, he liked Bernie. But he seems to be conservative on many different cultural issues. What is he? He's been, said in the past he's on the left. Sure sounds like he's on the right. I don't know. What did the vaccine, what did COVID do to our conception of partisanship? I think what we're looking at is, honestly, a modern-day America that doesn't fit the traditional definitions of the two parties. A mature economy, late-stage democracy, late-stage empire. I don't know. That no longer can you tell through the prism of, hey, should we have um, a progressive income tax bracket that goes to you know Eisenhower levels, or should we drop it to 25%? It just doesn't fit the American debate today. And someone, and I don't think just substantively, but stylistically, well, that's what Donald Trump did for many, is going to have to touch, is going to have to reach out, is going to have to be in touch with these independence story number three hey pick up after your kids and we need villains like draymond green uh check this story out from pitcher for the toronto blue jays andrew bass he tweeted the following he said with a picture of his kids anthony bass Pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays. The flight attendant at United just made my 22-week pregnant wife traveling with a 5-year-old and 2-year-old get on her hands and knees to pick up the popcorn mess by my youngest daughter. Are you kidding me? There's a picture. And, yeah, his, his kid's tapping away on an iPad. And, uh, yeah, there's a ton of popcorn on the floor underneath her seat. And Anthony Vass is mad that the flight attendant didn't clean it up herself, that she wanted the mom... To pick up the popcorn. I got to tell you. I'm with the flight attendant. Now, first of all, I'm going to presume, just because it seems inconceivable, Anthony Bass wasn't on the plane, right? Because why does the 22-week-old wife have to do it? You get on your hands and knees, Anthony. Clean up the popcorn. But I'm assuming he wasn't there. So, look, my kids are well past this age, but when you go to a restaurant, right? Maybe your kid's in the high chair, maybe he's not. And you know how it was, right? He's tossing food everywhere. Whatever. It's 
ending up on the floor. I mean, after a meal with kids and much more with multiple kids, the floor looks like an absolute battle zone. It looks like a food fight from Animal House. It's it's hard to imagine how one could get a ratio that is even in the realm of efficiency of food into mouth versus on the floor. It's it's a travesty. I, I, I don't, I'm not saying it makes me a better person, but I think it makes me the right way to do it. That my wife and I was like, oh, God, we can't we can't leave this restaurant like this. You, know, you can't expect the waitress or the busboy or whoever to deal with that. So you get out there real quick and I don't think you have to make it perfect either. I don't think you need to ask for the broom and you certainly don't need to ask for the rug cleaner. But you need to do a once over. You need, with your hands, you need to sweep it up, clean it up, get under the table. That ain't the waitress's job. Now, her job and the busboy's job is to clean. Correct. But I think we can all, don't, don't, don't we agree there's a threshold there, right? Like, let's say you went into a restaurant. Or say you were going to meet your buddies at a restaurant, right? Okay. And you went someplace else first and you grabbed, I don't know, a gas station burrito. And you come in with, you brown bag it and you're, you, you finished it maybe on your way walking in, but you want to hang out with your buddies and you're going to order an iced tea. Do you take the bag and just chunk it on the floor? Uh, they'll get it. Even at a stadium, I feel weird. Uh, peanut shells are always the, because that's what you're supposed to, right? Like at a ball game, you crack the peanut shells, you leave them on the ground and you shouldn't feel weird, right? They come through with a sweeper and do that. But you don't, I don't leave my trash on the on the floor. I take it with me on the way out. Throw it in the trash can. Right? Certainly at a restaurant. You don't expect the waitress to do that extra mess you made. You know, the beyond reasonable level of mess. And the flight attendant, and then they have the cleanup crew afterwards. Yeah, they're there for safety. They're there to, you know, hand out some drinks, that kind of thing. But are they there to... Get on your hands and knees and pick up the popcorn under your kids. No, I think you got to do that. I think you got to get on the hands and knees and do the cleanup job. I think it's beyond her job duty. I think you've pushed it to the limits. Now, the flight attendant, you know, ballsy enough to be like, hey, you. And by the way, 22 weeks, what is that? Five months? That's noticeably pregnant, right? Yeah. Can't remember. think so. Noticeably pregnant. I mean, You know, maybe we're all dealing with the human condition here. Like, oh, I'm sorry, you're pregnant. Maybe. If it's noticeably pregnant, okay, I got this one. But otherwise, you clean up after your kids. The world is not there for you to walk walk behind you, picking up you or your kids' mess. Or make the kids do it, by the way. These kids are toddlers. But they can lean down and pick up. Don't you think? It's not a hard ask. Clean up after yourself. The Golden State Warriors in round one of the playoffs have their hands full with the Sacramento Kings. The Kings have a 2-0 lead on the Warriors, and that home court advantage in Sacramento is amazing. It always has been. I'm so jealous. Maybe it's because they really only have the Kings. Hey, Dallas, we don't, we don't do this the same way. We're not, not at the Cowboy games, not at Mavs games, maybe the best at Stars games. Like, I think the Athletic just published a player's poll on, like, you know, most intimidating crowds and best places to play and worst. Like, for example, the Mavs, not worst, not best, just meh. Kings, man, that is a awesome home corner bench. And De'Aaron Fox has been great. So there's a moment in the game the other night where uh, DeMont Sabonis goes to the ground. He kind of gets tangled up with Draymond Green. Sabonis definitely grabs Draymond's leg and ankle a little bit. I mean, weak, like, ankle hold. And Draymond then, in a real super exaggerated punk way, you know, acts like he's been totally tripped, steps onto Sabonis' chest. Not that hard, by the way. And then sort of spring leaps up in the air, like launches trampolines off of Sabonis' chest. And then Sabonis does the European soccer star thing of acting like he had his chest cave in. Okay, look, no heroes in this story. But there is a villain Draymond got uh, a tech, a flagrant. He got ejected from the game, and he should. And here's my takeaway. Draymond is an absolute punk. Like, unlikable. And yet, necessary. And makes the NBA more entertaining. We need our villains. I think I've told you this story, right? When I was at ESPN, I did stories with Outside the Lines, and he's 60, and 
one of the guys in charge, a brilliant storyteller, when I were talking, and he was like, look, villains are better than heroes. They're just better, better characters through which to tell, tell a story. Heroes are flat. They're one-dimensional. Villains are complicated. They're interesting. Like, right now, I'm going to tell you, we're going to do a – have they done this? They haven't, I don't think. A singular, like, biopic of Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader. Be honest. Which one's more interesting? Darth Vader, origin story. Not Luke. Luke's boring. Vader's interesting. Kylo Ren, interesting. Walter White. We didn't just go into the anti-hero mode of storytelling because we're a degenerate culture, which we are. We're rotten. We did it because they're interesting. Like, their evolution. Their, what do you call it? De-evolution? Their deconstruction. Walter White, Tony Soprano, Villains, Saul Goodman, Deadwood, the bartender, Al Swearingen. Villains are interesting. Now, maybe that is because we don't have good enough storytellers with enough of a moral compass to see what is complicated or interesting about the journey of the hero. Not just a plot-driven journey, but the character-driven journey. Because it is hard to be the hero. I don't say that from personal experience. I don't. I wouldn't know. But I do know... That it's hard. You do the right thing, not because it's easy. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. And that's inherently what makes it hard. So if we had better storytellers, they could better understand the journey of the hero, the internal, the inside journey of the hero. Maybe we'd have better stories about heroes. But the way it is now, maybe it's just easier. They make it entertaining. Villains. And Draymond makes, I just got done the last podcast telling you I'm not captivated by the NBA playoffs. And now with Draymond going full heel WWE, yelling at the crowd, barking. Trust me, not likable, not a fan. But all of a sudden, I'm watching. I'm more interested. We need our villains. They make everything more entertaining. And I guess in the end, the vi villain is what gives rise to the hero. That's going to do it for me here on the Will Kane podcast. I've had a good time talking to you. I will see you again next time. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.